Welcome back everyone to the deep dive. Get ready because we are diving into the unsettling world of Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451. Yeah, we're talking a future where a fireman, well, they don't exactly put out fires. M more like start them right. Yeah, they start them. And it's a society where books are the enemy. And our guy. A guy named Guy Montag. Guy Montag, yeah, is stuck right in the thick of it. Right in the middle of it all. Yeah, and you know what's really interesting is that as you read it, you find yourself wondering, is this just some, you know, dystopian fantasy? Right. Or is this a chilling reflection of the times that we live in? It's really something Bradbury himself actually called this book a book of warning. Mm -hmm. And today we're going to explore how those warnings he put out might even be more relevant now than they were back when he actually put pen to paper. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, it's fascinating because Bradbury, he had this deep understanding of censorship. Yeah. Because he actually experienced it himself. He did. During his career. Can you imagine someone, you know, sort of getting their hands on your words and changing them? You know, trying to control your narrative. It's like your thoughts are being like extinguished before they can even catch fire. Exactly. It's like having your voice silenced. And I think that's part of what makes the title of this book so incredibly powerful. Yeah. You know, Fahrenheit 451. Such a stark title. Yeah. Bradbury, he learned that 451 degrees Fahrenheit, that's the temperature at which paper burns. Oh, wow. It's a simple fact, but it just throws you right into this world where yeah. knowledge is literally going up in flames. Yeah. It's like you can practically hear the crackle of the burning pages as you read it. Yeah. And the smell. But Bradbury wasn't just talking about literal fires, was he? No, no, no. He was actually even more concerned about a much more subtle kind of censorship. What do you This like slow and silent disappearance of ideas Ooh. that challenge us or that make us uncomfortable. Right. And that's where our protagonist, Guy Montag, comes into play. Okay. He's a fireman, but instead of, you know, putting out fires... He actually helps to start them. Yeah. He's a product of this society, right? Right. He's been taught to fear books. Yeah. And to embrace this life of just mindless distraction. He's like that friend we all have that's just glued to their phone, it's right? Totally. Like they, always scrolling, never present. Never present. You try to have a conversation with them and they're just gone. Gone. Yeah. And and that's what makes Montag's journey in this book so compelling. Oh. Because, you know, he starts out completely numb to the world around him. Yeah. But then he meets Clarice, Clarice, this free thinking young woman who just kind of shakes him out of his complacency. Clarice is like a breath of fresh air in this like stifling world. Yeah. She's asking all the why questions that no one else seems to even be thinking about. Yeah. Like when she asks Montag if he's ever stopped to just taste the rain. I mean, who does that anymore? Right. Like who does that? Yeah. She's the embodiment of everything that this society is trying to suppress curiosity, critical thinking. Yeah. You know, just experiencing the world with all of your senses. Right. You know, she plants a seed of doubt in Montag's mind. Yeah. And it just grows and grows. And with every interaction. Every single one. And those encounters are so short. But they're powerful. They're so powerful. And you can feel Montag changing. Absolutely. Questioning everything he thought he knew about his world. Yeah. And it makes you wonder, what would it take for us to start questioning? Right. You know, some of the things that we take for granted in our own lives. It's interesting, though, because, like, Clarice doesn't, like, shove any big ideas down Montag's throat. No. She's just... She's just herself. Yeah, she's just being herself. But in this world, that has, like, lost its soul. Yeah. That is a revolutionary act, just being authentic. And that's the really sad part about this society. They've confused conformity with happiness. Yes. Numbness with peace. A hundred percent. And, like, nowhere is that emptiness more obvious, yeah. more apparent... Than in Montag's own home. Yeah, his own wife. Mildred. Mildred. She is just checked out. Gone. Completely gone lost in this world of just mindless entertainment and distraction. Well, and Bradbury describes these parlor walls right. that surround her. And they're filled with these like vapid shows and jingles. Yeah, it's like eerily similar it's to so how we consume media today. It's like... He predicted the future, yeah. this constant barrage of information, the yeah. need to be constantly entertained. Right. It's almost like it's designed to keep us from thinking, from thinking too deeply, from questioning the status quo. Yes. And it works on Mildred. Totally. As long as she's got her shows playing. And her seashells whispering in her ears. She's happy. She's happy. She prefers that over real human connection. Which is the scary part. It's really scary. <laughs> it makes you wonder, are we becoming so 
addicted and dependent on our devices that we're forgetting how to connect with each other like in a meaningful way. On a deeper level, for sure. I mean, it's a question we all have to ask ourselves. Okay, exactly. Technology can be an amazing tool yeah. for connection, but it also can be used to isolate us and control us. And I think Bradbury's you know, urging us to be really mindful. Be careful. Yeah, be careful. How much, how are we using these tools yeah, to make yeah. sure that they're not turning us into these just passive consumers rather than active participants? Right. And Montec, he tries. Bless him. He tries to pull Mildred out of this digital fog. He does. He wants to talk to her. He wants to connect with her. He <laughs> wants to share these incredible stories that he's found in these books. But she's terrified. She is terrified. By the very idea of having to confront real emotions, real thoughts, mm -hmm. it's just too much for her. It's too much. And it's a powerful reminder of how insidious censorship can be. Right. Because it's not just about, you know banning books or like mm. silencing people it's deeper than that it's deeper it's about creating a culture where people are afraid to think their own thoughts yes they're afraid to question to feel to feel too deeply and what's even more tragic is that mildred she doesn't even realize what she's missing she doesn't it's, she's so caught up in this world of manufactured happiness yeah that she can't see the beauty the pain the richness all the complexities of what it means to really, truly live. It's like she's missing life. Completely. And Montag's starting to wake up. He is. He's starting to wake up to the emptiness of his own life, to the shallowness of the world around him. But he's surrounded by people who are content to just sleepwalk. Right. It's like he's coming up for air. Gasping for breath. And everyone else is just drowning. And then yeah. there's that turning point. Yes. That changes everything for him when he witnesses this woman choosing to die with her books instead of to live without them powerful moment what a moment right what a moment because in that moment the scales fall from his eyes yeah and he realizes that these books these forbidden objects they hold something way more powerful than just entertainment or information right they represent the essence of what it means to be human yeah the ability to think to feel to connect to something that's bigger than ourselves it gives me chills just thinking about this woman surrounded by flames holding on to her books like they're her children. It's power. What do you think in that moment Montag sees that changes everything? I think he sees courage. Yeah. I think he sees conviction, the power of an idea to give meaning and purpose to life, even in the face of death. Wow. And I think he sees that true freedom yeah. isn't about avoiding pain or seeking pleasure all the time. It's about the whole experience. It's about embracing it all. And in that moment, he decides he's going to live a life of meaning. That's right. Even if it means risking everything. A hundred percent. And so he goes all in on these books. He does. Right. He starts yeah. reading everything he can get his hands on. He's immersing himself in these stories and these ideas. That have been forbidden. That his society has said are bad. Right. And it's really remarkable because he doesn't even understand everything at first. Right. But he wants to learn. He wants to know more. He's hungry for it. Yes. He's starving for it. And that's when he reaches out for help. Right. He goes to Faber. The English professor. A man who understands the value of books. He gets it. And Faber recognizes a kindred spirit in Montag. He sees a little spark in him. A little flicker of hope in this fireman who is daring to question everything he's been told to believe. And it's Faber that points out that it's not even just the words in the books that are important. But the there. texture. The texture. Yeah, the experience of reading. It's about slowing down. Engaging with the material. Right, letting those ideas kind of like wash over you and challenge you. Yeah, change you. Transform you. Transform you. It's about the space between the words you know. Yeah. That allows for contemplation and reflection. It's like when you stumble on that one passage that just resonates. Oh, yeah. With your soul. Totally. And then it changes how you see the world. It's about the conversation that the books start. Absolutely. The connections that they make across time. Across time and space. And that's what Montague wants. He craves that. He craves those connections. He craves those moments of shared understanding. So he tries to share this newfound knowledge mm -hmm. with Mildred and her friends. Oh, boy. He thinks that they're going to be so moved by this poetry. Oh, yeah. But Big backfire. It does not go well. They're horrified. They're horrified. They're horrified by the emotion by the rawness right the uncomfortable truth and they're so used to being spoon-fed their entertainment they can't handle it they can't handle anything that makes them actually have to think or feel Ex they'd rather just go back to their mindless shows and their empty lives than face like reality yeah the challenge of real intellectual and emotional engagement 
Which brings us to the showdown yes. between Montag and Beatty. Talk about a clash of ideologies. Beatty's terrifyingly intelligent. He is scary. But he's a walking contradiction because he uses all this knowledge right. to justify destroying uh, it. Yeah. He's like, books are dangerous because they make people sad, they cause division, and they lead to questioning authority. And isn't that what's so shilling about Beatty? It is. He embodies this like intellectual arrogance. Oh, yeah. This type of leader that thinks they know what's best for everyone else, even if it means sacrificing freedom of thought. It's like he's read all the books, but he hasn't understood a single word. He's memorized the lines, but like the music, the soul of the stories. The meaning is just gone. Completely lost on him. Yeah. The ultimate perversion of knowledge, right? Right. Intelligence yeah. without empathy, without a moral compass. Well, he just keeps pushing Montag further and further. So he makes him burn his own house. Can you imagine? Destroying what's... everything he's come to value. But instead of breaking him. It sets him free. It does. He turns his flamethrower on Beatty. Oh. He becomes a fugitive. Yeah, such a powerful moment of rebellion, but it's also tragic. Oh, it's so tragic. You can feel the heat from the flames. You can feel the desperation. But in that act of defiance, yeah. he reclaims his humanity. He finds refuge with the most unlikely of allies. Right. The book people. The book people, this group of outcasts that have memorized entire texts to keep them safe. Living libraries. Isn't that wild? It's incredible. Carrying all of human knowledge. In their minds. Yes. And it is a testament to the power of stories. It is. The power of ideas. Of humanity. Of humanity itself. But it also is a stark reminder of how fragile all of this is. It is. If those book people are captured. Right. What happens if their memories fade? Koof. It's gone gone it's really scary it makes you think about what we as individuals right what do we carry with us it's so important what's so important that we would memorize it to keep it safe yeah and bradbury he doesn't let us off easy no he does not he takes us right to the end An end of the world as they know it the city is gone bombs have destroyed it obliterated completely wiped off the face of the earth and yet and yet there's hope there in the ashes yeah right there yeah that image of the book People walking away from the ruins, just walking towards a new dawn. It's hopeful. It is hopeful. Yeah. They're carrying nothing but the words that they've saved in their minds. The stories that they hold in their hearts. The guardians of knowledge. Right. And it makes you think, what would you carry? Yeah. In a world without Google, without Wikipedia, with no audiobooks. Right. Like, what would you commit to memory? What would you save? Wow. Yeah, it's a powerful question. And I think it's one that Bradbury wants us to like really sit with. Yeah. You know, long after we're done reading the book. Yeah. Because it's easy to take knowledge for granted when it's at our fingertips. Oh, yeah. Right there. It's everywhere. Yeah, but what happens when it's gone? Right. What if the internet just blinked out of existence? What if the library's closed? What if reading was a crime? Yeah. It makes you realize how important those book people really are. They really are. They're like living testaments to the power of memory. The resilience of humanity. To keep going even when things are rough. <laughs> but it's also a huge burden to carry. I was just thinking that. Can you imagine the weight of an entire culture's knowledge? In your mind. Yeah, just living in your memories. It's a responsibility and a privilege for sure. Right. It's both. Yeah. It reminds me of those oral traditions, you know? Oh, yeah. Where they pass down stories and histories, whole mythologies, just by word of mouth. From generation to generation. Yeah, and there's a beauty to that. A connection to something ancient. It's humbling. But also really fragile. Oh, absolutely. One lost memory and it's gone. Oof. Just like that. Yeah. And I think that's what Bradbury wanted to get across, you know? What's that? That knowledge is precious. It's something we have to take care of, protect, and share. So as we kind of wrap up our deep dive here on Fahrenheit 451, what do you think is like the biggest takeaway? Hmm. The biggest takeaway, I think Bradbury was reminding us that we decide our future. What do you mean? It's not something that just happens to us, you know? It's what we choose to do every day. The choices we make. Exactly. The books we pick up, the stories we tell each other, even just the conversations we have. It all matters. It all adds up to the world we're making. It's like a call to action. It is, like a challenge. What uh, are you going to do with your little piece of the world? Wow. Uh, well said. Um. Thank you for joining us for this deep dive into Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451. We hope this sparks some, you know, fires of curiosity and reflection. Maybe even a little rebellion. A little rebellion couldn't hurt. Keep those pages turning. Everybody, 
And until next time. And don't forget the power of a good book. It can change your world. Absolutely.